Okay, good morning. We were, uh, we were planning to look at this uh, first, or actually the second exercise set, as the first thing we do today. So let's start. Let's um, look at these uh, exercises. Uh, okay, now I believe these exercises have an English counterpart in the textbook, actually. So, if uh, I, most of you can speak Norwegian, so it's it's okay. But I, I'll try to translate this now. Okay, it says here that two cross-country skiers should compete against each other in a race. Both are exactly equally good uh, and they both know this. The use of a certain doping substance or performance enhancing drug as we sometimes call it in English can however lead to a secure victory for one of them if the other one does not use the drug. So this means that these two athletes, they are clones, they are exactly equally good, and if one of them applies this performance enhancing drug and the other does not, then the guy or the female who uses the drug will win with security. So this is a perfect doping substance then, okay? It works. It leads to a certain victory. There is only this performance enhancing drug available. There is no other potential drugs. Of course, in reality, there is a lot of different options when it comes to drug abuse. That is, of course, to make things simpler, okay? So there is one drug which they can choose to take or not to take. If they use this performance enhancing drug, there is a possibility of being caught. Okay, so there is some testing performed here. And that test may reveal the use of this substance. And if they are being caught or revealed or as drug abusers, there is some kind of negative consequence. Okay, that seems reasonable. Either shame or punishment or whatever. Okay, so there is some kind of uh, not uh, what they would like to happen uh, that will happen if they are being exposed as drug users. This consequence is uh, judged by both as more negative than losing the race. Uh, both cross-country skiers assume the probability of being caught as a doper as small but positive and equal for both. So it's kind of the same exposure probability here. Do you think this, uh, uh, this information corresponds to reality? Is it as easy? to be exposed if you use drugs in all different countries, for instance? Is it easier to get away with it, let's say in Russia, compared to Germany? Or is it the other way around? Okay. It could be, okay, that there is some 
differences here because these doping programs they are not uh, they are not equal okay they differ between countries and the same could be the f the, the, cons the same could uh, also be related to the consequence couldn't it because it may be that certain countries does not think that doping is such a crime as other countries do so you see we're kind of uh, trying to again simplify down here and making some uh, uh, grave simplifications basically so then there's kind of an open uh, a question here discuss how this information can lead to a model through a game okay let me show you my solution <coughs> Okay. Exercise one, set two. Okay. <coughs> so maybe we can think, start thinking about strategies here. What are the decisions which these cross-country skiers may take here? And it seems reasonable, doesn't it, to, us to do it as simple as possible and, and stick to two options. So either they take, take the drug we can uh, give that uh, a letter name, let's use a D here. Meaning that they take the drug uh, and, and the uh, other alternative is not, of course, to take it, not to take it, and to be in accordance with the solution here. Uh, yeah, okay. Let's use and the for that option. Okay, no drug, drug. Okay, a few words about the strategies here. So. Uh, uh, what about the information here? Normally, of course, these athletes do not communicate their drug habits with each other. That may be dangerous, okay? So, in general, we would expect this as a kind of simultaneous situation where each athlete will have to make up his mind on whether to take this drug without information about the competitor or potentially other competitors. Okay, so this seems like a reasonable simultaneous game. Number of players Reasonable to assume two, isn't it? These two athletes. And uh, there are two here. It's defined in the exercise. So uh, two. This is given in the text. Okay. What about payoffs here? Maybe the hardest part. Now what we know from the text here is that if player 1, maybe I should use a Roman number here, chooses to take drug and player 2 chooses not to take drugs, if this is the case then player 1 wins. Okay? And player 1 wins the race. That's given in the text here. Of course, the other way around will have the same consequence. So if P1 chooses not to take drugs while P2 chooses to take the drug, in that case P2 wins. And they win with certainty. Okay, what if they choose the same strategy, either to take drugs or not to take drugs. Maybe it's easiest to start with 
not taking drugs. So if player one chooses and D and player two chooses and D. What happens in that situation? Now we know that these athletes are equally good. Okay. And that should mean, shouldn't it, that there should be a probability of a half that player one wins and a probability of a half that player two wins. That is kind of the interpretation we must make here. We can't say that any one of them wins. We, the only thing we basically know is that there is an equal probability that each of them wins. So this should have the consequence that the P uh, probability of a win for any should equal a half. Of course, in this case, the probability that player one wins is one. Probability there is zero, the other way around here. Now, if they take drugs, what happens then? They started out being equally good. They took a drug, both of them, which of course increased their performance, but being clones and assuming that the effect has an equal, sorry, assuming that the drug has an equal effect on both of them, of course you end up with the same probability distribution, don't you? So in this case, we should expect the same probabilities for any outcome. Okay, but there is something happening here in addition, isn't it? something related to this exposure probability. So they risk being exposed with a certain cost here. Okay. And we have to put that into our model. So here there is also a risk of exposure. So there is a certain probability of being exposed as a drug abuser and that probability has an associated cost. Okay, there is a certain cost here plus cost of exposure. And we have to put that into our model in one way or the other. Okay. Now we kind of need to make some definitions of these actual consequences, okay? We need to put something into the value of winning of winning, the value of losing, and the value, or actually cost, of exposure. So each of these three elements must have some kind of either number, numerical value, or parametric value. And to make it general here, I kind of put in some para parameters here. So I, I just put a name on this. I call this A. Okay, this is the first price. That this is what you get when you win. Could be prize money, could be medals, could be the honor, whatever. Some kind of combined positive value, which is linked to winning this race. Of course, we could have put something here, but to make it simple, I just put zero here. Again, you can kind of make this difference as big as we like by increasing A. So we do not lose generality by putting a zero in. It makes things easier. And then there's this cost here, which we can call C. And it is, we symbolize it being a cost by putting a negative sign in front of it. OK. Then we kind of have made our model. Now everything we need is defined. Okay, we have kind of found the probability distribution for any kind of outcome. We have the values, and as long as we accept that we can kind of calculate expected payoff, now we have what we need to do that. So let's start doing that. And then we might do that over here, perhaps, or maybe 
Maybe we can do it in the middle here. That seems like a good place. Now so let's look at this outcome. If both chooses to take drugs, okay, and we want to find the expected payoff for each player. Now if both take drugs, we have a probability of a half for a win of each of them. If you look at uh, uh, player one now, E1 we can call that. Uh, it is straightforward, isn't it? It's a half a probability of winning. And of course it's also a half a probability of losing, but losing gives nothing here, so that's really not necessary to calculate in. But as they actually take drugs here, there is an ex exposure probability. As you probably understand now, we kind of assume that this doping test is perfect. Which means that if you don't if you did if you don't take drugs, you're not exposed. That could happen in reality, couldn't it? At least we, we, we can think so. But in this case we assume that if you have not taken drugs, then any drug test will not expose you. But if you have taken, then you may be exposed by a certain probability. So we have to subtract this cost times the probability of being exposed in this R I haven't defined. Maybe I should do that. Let's call this risk of exposure something R. So this is the expected payoff for player one, given that he has chosen to take drugs and his opponent also has chosen to take drugs. Of course we can simplify this slightly. This is half A minus CR. This one vanishes. And of course this holds also for player 2, doesn't it? So E2 must be the same. So now we have kind of calculated two values for the expected payoff that should be in our game table or game matrix. What about N D N D okay That's simpler, isn't it? If they don't take drugs, they still have a probability of a half of winning, but by our assumption that the drug test is perfect, they will not face the risk of being exposed here. So the only thing they need to wor worry about, should I say, or actually like is how to distribute this A between them. And of course it must be a half A for both players here. Of course this one holds, producing a half A, this one vanishes. So if you think about a table representation now, we have actually started filling in values, haven't we? We have player one here, he can choose to take drugs, or let me try to be in correspondence with my notes. Now we have found out, haven't we, that if both take drugs, there should be something here. It should be half an A uh, minus RC half an A minus RC. Well, at the bottom part here, where nobody takes drugs, it should be half an A. Now, Yanka, if you are uh, struggling with the Norwegian exercises, I think there are counterparts in the textbook. Yeah, you probably are able to decode. I think also this holds for most of the exam exercises. Okay. That was half of the job. So what about the remaining parts here? Uh, 
what happens with an old drug taker if the other one takes drugs? For instance, down here. What's happened with this guy here? He will not win, will he? Because we have kind of assumed here that if this is the situation, then player two wins with certainty and the same the other way. So the no drug taker here, he will kind of face nothing, okay? He will not win, he will not lose. No, oh, sorry, he will not win, he will lose, which produces zero, and he will not be exposed as a drug taker because he hasn't taken drugs. So but there must be a zero here. There must be a zero here, wasn't it? So what about the drug taker here? Takes drugs. Player two, he's up here. He will win with certainty. So he will get the whole price, A, not half of it. Okay. But of course, he is still exposed. He could still be exposed as a drug taker. And of course, the same here. So this is the kind of solution you should put into this exercise. Of course, this is not an easy exercise. I would not expect that any of you would be able to do this on Exxon, okay? So this is just kind of telling you how you could do this if you were at a slightly different level game theoretically than you actually are. So if I give this kind of exercise, I typically would give this as the content and ask you to, to explain how it kind of arrived, okay? Instead of exposing you to actually do it yourself. So in principle, we have solved A now, okay? We have been discussing a p p possible way of doing this, which is simplified. But th there could be hundreds and millions of different ways of doing this, couldn't it? We could have uh, we could have made it more complex, introducing a non-perfect drug test, which could produce a double false, as we call it meaning that you expose somebody who hasn't taken drugs with a new probability that would make things more tricky. We could introduce more possible doping substances that would produce lists like this, wouldn't it? Drug could be drug one, drug two, drug three, drug four, and so on, okay? We could introduce more players here. Normally, there are it's very rarely that we see two cross-country skiers competing. Normally, there's more than two, isn't it? Even at the sprint competitions, there are at, are at least six at the heat. And of course, the idea is perhaps to win the final. So that's several heats. So you have a lot of competitors. Okay. So this is an extremely simplified doping model. But it has some interesting properties. Basically, we have also answered question B now, because we have kind of discussed the link now between this model and reality. And we kind of can conclude that there's a big difference between reality and this model. And basically, that's the idea with most mathematical models, that there, is, there should be a big difference between reality and these models. Uh, it's very seldom that we are able to construct a model that mimics reality in a good way. So we're not asked here to analyze the game. Should we spend a little time on doing that, perhaps, as well? We can do that, can't we? Now we have the table here. We can try uh, searching for Nash equilibrium. Let's do that. Okay. Uh, let me see my solution. Did I do that in the solution? Yes, I did. So now we're kind of moving uh, away from the actual exercise text here into maybe a question C that could have been formulated, but which wasn't actually. So sub question C with hyphens indicating that it's really not there, but we're making it up on the fly.
probably know that on Latin, the plural form is not es. So it's not equilibriums, it's equilibria. Okay. Uh, then what we want to do then is to compare uh, if at the start this one with this one, of course, then we uh, automatically also compare this one with that one, don't we? So the question now is whether half an A minus RC either is positive or half an A minus RC is negative. If it's positive, then of course this number is bigger than that one. Now let's look first at this situation here. Let's assume that this is the case. If that is the case, if this is a negative number, then we get a circle around this one, don't we? This one leads to that one. Agree? And of course, if we move to player 2 now, this one is bigger than that one, then we get a square around this zero. Okay, so this assumption produces this circle and this square. Let's look a little bit more on this expression here. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's take this inequality and add half an A on each side of the inequality side. That's legal, isn't it? That doesn't change this one. So we take half an A minus RC less than zero, and then we add half an A on each side. If we do that, we get half an A here plus the what we have already, half an A minus RC less than half an A, don't we? Just adding half an A on each side. That doesn't change it. Half an A plus half an A is a whole A, isn't it? So then we end up with A minus RC is less than half an A. That's interesting, isn't it? Because now we can, we, we can see that this assumption also solves the two remaining best reply functions, doesn't it? Automatically. Because when we know this, that A minus RC is less than half an A, then we can check this one, can't we? A minus RC is less than this one, then our circle should be around that one, shouldn't it? Of course, now we can also look at this comparison and that one is smaller than that one, then of course we end up with this one. So, we have established that given this assumption, our game produces one Nash equilibrium in pure strategies, this one. Nobody takes drugs. That's nice, isn't it? Okay. What about reality? We know that somebody takes drugs, don't we? We see that every year. So the solution of nobody taking drugs does not seem to correspond with reality. That's uh, not how we see reality. So maybe this assumption is silly then. Maybe it's the other assumption that's sensible. Now let's think about what this means. Okay, It says here that half an A should be bigger than R times C. That is the actual consequence of this by just moving this one. What is this? This is half of the price money, isn't it? For a competition. What is this? This is the punishment you get if you're being exposed. What kind of punishment do you get? Do you have to pay back the money? You have to deliver back the gold medal, don't you? If you're exposed in Olympics, you have to hand it back, but the gold medal doesn't mean anything. 
So basically, it seems reasonable that this must be the case. Okay, this number here is normally much, much bigger than this one. The probability of being exposed is actually fairly small. Although we really don't know it, you would expect it to be very small. And as, as long as this one is small, of course, it's easy to argue that this one must be bigger. Actually, we could expect that half an MRC will be much, much bigger, bigger than RC in reality. So what happens then? The opposite happens, doesn't it? We have to change all of our best reply functions. So this one will suddenly be this one. This one will suddenly be this one. This one will suddenly be this one. And this one will suddenly be that one. So then we suddenly end up with the opposite result, don't we? We end up here. Everybody takes drugs. So of course this simple model produces simple answers. Either nobody takes drugs or everybody takes drugs. But we have kind of tried to argue now that it's maybe more sensible to assume that everybody takes drugs than that nobody takes drugs, based on our argument here. And this is kind of the major result of the so-called economics of doping research. Okay, this answer here that we t it turns out that there is a high tendency to expect people to use drugs if they are rational, meaning trying to maximize their best interests. Then, of course, there is a concept, a, a question about morality and norms and ethics, which kind of comes in on the side here, doesn't it? Even though we were, all of us were offered the option of robbing a bank, risk-free, some of us would still not do that, would we? Due to the fact that we know it's illegal, it's perhaps also immoral, because then we steal the money of somebody else, and so on. Okay? So there is also some other aspects here, but this is obviously a problem, because it kind of tells us that we should expect a strong force pushing athletes to be interested in using drugs. Have anybody of you ever tried drugs? If I ask this question, nobody will say yes, would they? Or maybe you should say yes. Let's think a little bit about that, okay? Now we're moving into something else. Um, now if you ask people about uh, athletes or sports people about their drug abuses, of course there are two situations. Either you are a drug taker or you are a no drug taker, okay? And you're given this question, do you take drugs? Now suppose this is some kind of uh, research, okay? WADA has started asking athletes whether they use drugs or not. And of course, if they get a big number of drug takers here, we would expect that they would have to intensify their anti-doping programs, making more tests, making better tests, and so on. This, of course, is not in the interest of the drug takers, is it? So the drug takers, they would lie here, OK? They would say, no, I don't take drugs. Because if they say that they take drugs, they would expect more drug tests, which are bad for them. And they assume that they're rational. What about these guys who don't take drugs? What kind of answer should they give? They have the exact opposite interests of these drug takers, don't they? Their interest is to show high amounts of drug taking. Because that would lead to more drug tests, which are better for these guys. Because then they will get rid of these stoppers. So they would also lie, wouldn't they? So this is what we, what we call a non-truth-telling mechanism. Okay? If you ask people these kind of questions, everybody will lie. Unless they are in strict favor of the Eighth Commitment, okay, which says that you shouldn't lie. So again, of course, there are norms here. But you see, it's tricky to ask people questions like this. You would expect the opposite around. But of course, if these people are sensible and rational, they would actually understand this. And they would understand, I can't lie here. Because that's what's expected. So what should they do then, do you think? What about randomizing? Because then the researcher here wouldn't know what happens. Okay, So we would perhaps, in the actual ultimate Nash equilibrium here, 
we would expect mixed strategy in Ashe Equilibra in this kind of game. It's a kind of a game between athletes as one player and the researcher as another player. So you see, this is not simple. Okay? It's not easy to construct investigations to reveal how drug takers actually behave. And for that matter, non-drug takers. So these are, of course, two different ways of looking at this. This is kind of looking at doping research. As such, this is more like looking at doping as such. Okay, how would we expect it to work? Of course, we can extend this model in many different uh, di dimensions, if you like, introducing players which are not clones, for instance. We can say that one of the players is slightly better than the other. What, what would happen then? And that would actually have impact. It would lead to a smaller force here, as we perhaps should expect regarding our previous discussion yesterday about the cross-country racing, okay? When you kind of make athletes more apart performance-wise, then it's of course not so much gain for the bad athletes to use drugs. And it's not as necessary for the good ones as well, okay? Because they are good. So making athletes less competitive compared to each other it's a good thing when it comes to doping. On the other hand, it's a bad thing when it comes to uncertainty outcome, isn't it? So to some extent, you can see here that doping creates uncertainty outcome. If you take doping away, then genetics rules, okay? So the Africans who are good runners, they be st are still good runners, and the Europeans can never beat them. Okay. But if you give the Europeans the potential of using drugs, then of course they can kind of get to a comparable level. This is kind of the paradox of sports, isn't it? That there is a kind of a conflict here between the uncertainty of outcome and drug abuse. That's a, a re really big problem. There is also another conflict, of course. If we assume that the audience of sports activity are interested in performance, it's nicer to see a 100 met meter run on 9.85 than on 10.2. And of course, that will also lead in favor of, of drug taking. Because you can't run 100 meter or 9.8 without drugs, can you? That's not possible. You know that, don't you? Every Olympic 100 meter field contains dopers. Everybody of them. Okay, it's not possible to run at these speeds without using drugs. You can see it on them. You see their muscles, okay? They are not natural. You have to use steroids to get these kind of muscles. You knew this, didn't you? This is not news for you? You seem like you don't believe me. Do we have any athletes here? No, we have the tennis player. Have you seen any drug uh, abuse, Jenko? Mm -hmm. Have you seen any drug abuse when you played tennis? I didn't say <laughs> Have you seen, have you been suspicious? Yeah. Oh, you have? Okay. Uh, luckily, we don't see this so much in football, don't do we? Why don't we see it so much in football? Ah, come on. Football is a complex sport, isn't it? It kind of rewards a lot of different dimensions. Speed, strength, wiseness. And there is a conflict here, isn't it? If you take too much steroids, then it affects your mind, okay? You get either, I wouldn't say crazy, but you, you get some problems with your mind, okay? And these problems on your mind are not good when it comes to playing football. You can still run 100 meters fast, but playing football is slightly more difficult, okay? You have to be able to observe and make decisions all the time, okay? And these decisions are affected adversely by steroids. Of course, you can use uh, EPO or Blood doping, that, that is nice, even in football, because getting more stamina is good. Okay. And this has not the negative side effects on your mind. But in general, uh, we can expect less doping abuse in football, and I think that's correct. On the other hand, there is some grave negative examples. You probably heard about this Juventus scandal ba back in 1997, have you heard about that? No. You have heard about it, Simon? Yeah, what was happened? What happened? There were some players that were accused of doing drugs. Not actually some, everybody, the whole team. 
yeah, as far as I remember. Okay, you know, you may even know that Rosenborg was playing the quarterfinals in Champions League against this Juventus team, and they they what was the outcome? I think they played one one at home and they lost two zero away or something. And of course, this Juventus team should have been taken out. Okay. That means that the Rosenborg should have been in the semi-finals actually in Champions League. That would be the right decision. But of course, it's hard to do retrospective doping judgments. Okay, you cannot replay the Champions League from '97. That's not possible. So we we have seen some nasty examples, uh, even in football. And of course, we we really don't know because the number of doping tests being done in football is relatively low of course again due to the fact that we believe that it's less of it but there are ways in football which we should ac perhaps expect doping and it could be related to adrenaline uh, you know when you do football you have it's complex okay you have to do a lot of things at the same time more or less make a lot of decisions and if you're very nervous this is very difficult and there's a lot of sub substances, as we, you probably all know, that could kind of take this nervousness down to a more sensible level. Of course, using this tranquilizing stuff could be very beneficial in football, especially at the big matches. Because there's a lot of players who are not able to perform at their best due to too much nervousness. So we should perhaps expect these kind of things to happen. In the old days, as you probably know, they used to take a drink or two before the matches in the UK. Maybe they do it still. Of course, the effect is to kind of try to calm you down a little bit so that you're able to perform. Have you tried that? Drinking alcohol before performing? Maybe it's not so easy in tennis. You have to hit the ball. But uh, it depends on the number of drinks, doesn't it? If there's too many, then it's kind of devastating. If it's the exact amount, then it should work. OK. That was this. Do you have any questions? So to sum up, uh, doping is a problem, maybe so not so much in football as in other sports. And it, uh, our kind of game theoretic approach here tells us that it should be a problem. We should expect this problem. And it also provides a certain solution, doesn't it? Because the solution is very simple. Either we could make this one smaller, we can take this one down, so much that this one flips in this direction. So we can stop paying all these athletes all this money. Okay, that would be nice for doping. Alternatively, we could do, do what they do, try to increase these R, make doping tests better, which is much better to do this one, isn't it? To make this one higher. Because it's very costly to increase this a little bit. It's not costly at all to increase this a lot. So instead of oh, putting them out for two or three years, you could say, OK, you have to pay all you have earned up to now. If you had that kind of system, then of course this one would increase immensely, turning it to this direction. And you would move the Nash equilibrium from this point down here. So it seems kind of crazy, doesn't it? They seem to do what they shouldn't do. Instead of either taking this one down or this one up, they try to increase this one. Why do they do that, do you think? It's so easy to fight doping. No problem at all. Why don't they do it? It could be that they want it. Okay. That's a, that's a possibility, isn't it? We have talked about the demand-boosting effect of performance. Okay. So if you run faster, jump higher, more people come to watch. And of course, doping has this effect that it produces those who runs faster and those who jumps higher and those who throws longer. As long as you can have this silly argument that we are trying as best we can to get rid of it, but we still have it a little, act actually enough to make these demand boost work, then everybody is happy. Okay? So you see, there's some kind of outer equilibrium here which is far more complex than the doping game itself. So there are intensives, incentives for the sport officials to have a certain amount of do doping. That could, of course, be the, the reason why they haven't fought it by doing what they should do here. 
Now, if you think about the Champions League qualification, a single match, okay, which produces either zero or a hundred million Norwegian crowns. That is too much not to use drugs, is it? If drugs could help you get gaining these hundred million crowns, you would take any kind of drug you like. So instead of giving them a hundred million, you should give them just ten, okay, and take the remaining ninety and divide them freely around all other football teams. The problem, of course, with this one is that you you cannot you kind of don't evaluate the high performer per performance. So this is kind of a paradox here. You it's not as easy as I try to tell you, okay? Even though it seems easy here, take this one down. Taking it down has some consequences. Manchester United gets pissed off, don't they? Barcelona doesn't like this. They are actually dependent on these sums to buy the players. They need to be at the level they are. So we are going to make some problems for ourselves here. Okay? Okay. Let's take a break.